On va voir la caméra à l'écran. La diffusion vient de démarrer. Tous les participants sont en mode écoute seul. Non Ok. Well, <rire> good day everybody. Uh, today we were supposed to be uh, broadcasting live from uh, Saint Anne de Bellevue uh, from the well we are in Saint Anne de Bellevue st still but from the head office of Valacta but we had a little bit of internet problems so we've just made a rush move to McGill so welcome live from uh, McDonald campus uh, of McGill University so uh, Trevor you've been doing a lot of traveling this morning <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, yeah. that's we're it. Good. We're good to go. <laughs> so we're we uh, we're just uh, calming down right now and uh, to make you comfortable and make sure you're uh, recuperating okay from our run. Uh, I'm serving okay. you a uh, hundred percent Canadian chocolate milk. So um, and in our rush, I didn't have enough time to bring myself a mug. Okay. So well, since you sure. are. Uh, my guest. Uh, all right, and welcome everybody. We hope that you are uh, comfortably installed uh, wherever you are, uh, coast to coast in Canada. Welcome to this second webinar, uh, a, bar a barn a source of comfort. We'd like to know, actually, we need to know uh, how you're installed, uh, who you are with, what province you're, you are in, and actually to do so, uh, we invite you to uh, comment uh, in the chat box of the uh, in the GoToWebinar uh, screen. So uh, just write, and our colleague Anne-Marie, who is uh, coordinating, uh, you don't see her, but <laughs> she's dancing right now, who's coordinating this whole uh, project. She's uh, in front of the computer, and she will be uh, taking your comments and answering. Actually, as we go along today, um, please do not hesitate to send in questions or comments. We will do our best to uh, answer them. Uh, Anne-Marie will be taking notes of them and relaying them to uh, relaying them to us. Uh, she has a mic, so we'll do our best. And we'll do all be our best also to uh, be right on time. So today we, are, we have an hour and a half together. Um, this webinar today is a presentation by the Dairy Farmers of Canada. This great initiative is all uh, funded through the Dairy Farmers of Canada in collaboration with Valacta and, of course, with Dr. Trevor DeVries. Uh, who will be with us today to discuss this uh, topic about uh, comfort in the barn. Welcome, officially. We had a great time in the first webinar and looking forward to another uh, good session here uh, discussing this uh, topic in further detail today. Absolutely. Anne-Marie, I will need uh, to change the slides, so if you can please... Uh... All right, okay. So um, today our topic... I have my colleague also. We have many people helping us today. It's great teamwork. Thank you. Um, so today, our specific topic about cow comfort will be about the surface, uh, specifically a comfortable surface in the barn. For those of you who attended uh, the first webinar, uh, you know that we've introduced uh, the topic of comfort by discussing the evaluation. How do we know that cows are comfortable? And we're moving on to the second topic today. If any of you, uh, by any mischance, have missed the first webinar, uh, please note that all the recordings and documents and videos are available on the dairyknowledge.ca uh, website, so you can watch it uh, even after today and you, you'll, be, uh, you'll be able to follow. I mean, it doesn't have to be uh, one after the other, absolutely. Um, Today we will be, not only you can ask us questions, but we will be questioning you and interacting uh, with you. So uh, you, we will uh, throw in survey questions to you and expect your answers. And we will start right away to practice. Uh, since I'm, um, I'm assuming that we have dairy producers from various provinces, I'm assuming also that we have dairy producers with barns of different types. So the first question, and Marie, I need to change the slide again. Yeah. So uh, the first question we are asking today is, what type of barn uh, do uh, you house your cows in? So very simple question. We're not being too tricky to start with. First uh, choice, high stall, free stall, bedded straw pack, composted bedding. Uh, it could be sand also. Uh, or maybe you're not a dairy producer, so you don't own a barn, and we'd like to, you ha to know how many of you uh, today are, are stakeholders or people like us who love cows but uh, <laughs> don't milk them every day. So we're leaving you a couple of seconds here, and 
and we'll see the, the answers uh, coming in in a few seconds. Is your chocolate milk good? It is. <laughs> Do we have any comments, uh, Anne-Marie, of uh, or people telling us where they're... Um... Did it work? Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So um, 30%, so the thir third of the people are Thai stalls today. Uh, another third, 34% precisely, are free stall. Nobody's deep pack bedding or, or sand bedding or composted bedding. And, uh, and a third is people like us. Uh, professionals or teachers or students, or whoever they are, employees. All right, so that's very interesting. So we've got a excellent, very <laughs> good, well, good distribution of people. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, I see the 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 university teacher <laughs> speaking here. <laughs> All right. Um, for those of you uh, who have a Twitter account, we invite you to follow us today. Today and the days after, we uh, invite you in um, in our conversation about cow comfort in the barn under the hashtag Comfortable Barn. Uh, and uh, there's a few of us on our team uh, that have accounts there, so we'll be entertaining uh, the conversation with you. But if you do have specific comments, any technical problems or anything today, we'd prefer that you uh, send them through the chat box uh, because uh, we'll, it, it'll be easier for us to follow them for today. All right, so let's get on with our topic, right? Uh, first, before we start, uh, Anne-Marie, we will need to move the slide again. <laughs> um, before we start, actually, uh, I would like to remind you that there's this guide about um, evaluating and improving cow comfort in your barn. That's available, again, on the Dairy Knowledge website as well as on, uh, as well as on the Volacta website. This is a guide that we've developed uh, in parallel to uh, the course that we gave to 1,700 dairy producers in Quebec and the Maritime Provinces, yes, uh, not yesterday, last year, <laughs> sorry. And um, this guide is a very complete uh, document that can help you uh, go through the evaluation of your cows in your barn and directing you towards um, possible improvements that you may want to make and the, the recommendations, basic recommendations. The topic that we'll be covering today um, is covering part of what's in this guide. So when you see at the right top corner of the slide uh, page number, it's referring to this guide today. All right, so if we uh, if we go back, uh, it's throwback to Thursday today, I think. <laughs> so if we go back to our last uh, webinar, uh, as we said uh, earlier, we went through the evaluation of comfort. How do we know that our car cows are comfortable? And I think it would be interesting to just uh, remind us what were the indicators. Yeah, so the, for the first webinar, we really went over four areas where we uh, saw as important for the comfort of dairy cows, specifically looking at the cow, so looking at overt signs of poor comfort on the cow, looking for injuries, so we specifically talked about injuries to the legs, to the knees, to the necks of cows, and then also looked at or, or spoke about lameness as being a, a good sign uh, or, or a bad sign actually of <laughs> poor comfort in, in dairy cows. And then we also looked at not only the, the cows themselves, but then um, how the cow actually functions within her environment and how that might uh, be a sign of, of good or poor uh, comfort in the barn. So looking at things like how the cow gets up and down, right. so how much time she takes, um, the, the motions that she goes through when she gets up and down, um, as well as looking at her behavior within the barn in terms of standing where is she standing? Is she perching in stalls? Uh, is she uh, spending time uh, lying in awkward positions in the stalls? And also looking at how cows distribute themselves in the stalls, right. whether or not they're lying near each other or trying to avoid each other. So using all these different uh, signals that the cow gives us, not only from her behavior, but also uh, from her basically uh, looking at her and looking at signs of poor comfort, we can, we can really evaluate uh, the, the comfort of the cow in her current environment. Right. And so um, at the end of our last webinar, if you remember well, we uh, gave a little homework to our participants. We hope that you had the chance to, uh, to do it. And actually, we asked you to evaluate hawk injuries in your herd. 
20 cows randomly and evaluate hawk injuries and just to have a uh, an idea of an indicator of discomfort in your barn. Uh, can you remind us what, how we base the evaluation of uh, hawk injuries? So yeah, we had a. It's so, coming. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Good. So yeah, so we uh, we asked uh, as per the guide to uh, score the hawks of the cows based on this four point scale. So yes. so really looking for. Anything from a zero, which is basically no hair loss, um, uh, uh, no no swelling, no no overt signs again of, of any injury to the leg, to slight hair loss of, of score one again, and then uh, in scores two and three where we actually see hair loss, we see swelling, we see lesions yeah. on the legs of the cows, and we're really looking for you to count those cows that had a score of say two or three right. so that we'd consider injured and, and which will be scored as part of again what we talked about last time the proaction program is being right. uh, injuries on cows. Yes so what we uh, we have asked you is to calculate the percent of your 20 cows evaluated how many of them scored two or three and what's the percentage that you obtained and so uh, now we will ask you uh, what is the result that you've obtained. So what is the percentage of cows that showed injuries scoring two and three um, among, in your herd among those 20 cows? Uh, is it A, zero to 10%? Is it B, 11 to 20%? C, 21 to 50%? Or D, 51 and above? Um, it says a plus, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're a bit bilingual here, right, Trevor? Uh, partially. <laughs> All right. Some of us are. <laughs> so what are you expecting will be the results while, while the participants are answering? Uh, my hope would be that most of our participants would be in the first category. Um, uh, <laughs> I would expect, though, there to be some variation, so, yeah. um, and so hopefully we'll see... Uh, some range in there as well. So, are so we do seeing we have the results? Res and Marie, do we have results? Oh, we, it, there's a bit of a delay to uh, on our computer <laughs> because we are uh, we are in a different environment than to, than we are usually. We are um, our monitor is on my. Okay, so we're gonna go. <laughs> okay, so eighty. Well, give it to us, and Marie, I I can't read that far. <laughs> So we have 63% um, of the participants who said they had between uh, 0 and 10, 31% between 11 and 20, 6% uh, between 21 and 50, and 0 over 51. Okay. okay. So most. Very good. No, that's, uh, that's very good. Um, uh, if we think about those results, if we think about the original cluster results, and Maria, I need to change the slide. <laughs> All right. Um, here's just a reminder then of, of where we were for the original uh, research cluster that was um, a research cluster project that was conducted a number of years ago in Canada, looking at the uh, prevalence of these injuries in cows, uh, broken down in this case by farm types. So again, by uh, farms with tie stalls, those with free stalls, as well as those with robotic milking systems. Um, we saw, uh, I guess, a few things of note, some variability between systems with uh, tie stall having probably the highest uh, prevalence, a little bit lower in free stall, and then our robot herds actually a little bit uh, less than that. Um, and then quite a bit of variability with, with a fair number on that bottom 50% uh, uh, of farms. And so it's really nice to see that uh, um, the producers that are participating today uh, are found, all in the top 25. Found less than that. Uh, <laughs> we hope they're all honest and and uh, and no and doubt, no doubt, no, no. sure. No. And and so, um, but one of the things that we we noticed in, as part of the cluster project was the the variability. So we have some farms doing very well. We have some farms doing not so well. And and so uh, and I think we talked about this last time. The the beauty of that is that uh, what that allows us to do, and and some of those results are going to be presented here today are to look at some of the associations with that variability and we talked about that already last time and and uh, we're going to be speaking about some of that some of that data today as well as other data that we have to support why we might see such variability in terms of things like 
uh, hawk injuries on cows on, on our farms here in Canada. Exactly. So once we've made uh, the assessment and we found out what, that we have injuries, lameness, whatever we've observed, the idea is to look for what may have caused it. Yeah, definitely. And so we can we can start then uh, identifying those risk factors. So starting to look at the actual environment of the cow, look at the factors that are going to influence the behavior of the cow in her stall, uh, look for factors that we know potentially uh, are risk factor for injuries, right? To, um, they don't magically come out of the air. They, they have to come from somewhere. And so by, by looking at how we house and how we manage our cows, we should be able to identify those right. risk factors. It's going to be different from barn to barn, and the factors may vary in time also, depending if you've changed anything. So I guess uh, one good start, uh, again, in, our, in the guide of uh, evaluating comfort in the barn, there are... Um, there is a list of possible causes for the different observations that you uh, that you may have in your herd. Uh, but today we are going to focus on uh, the causes related to surface problems. So basically today we will discuss what is a comfortable surface, what are the criteria that we base comfort of the first surface on, um, what could be potential practical hands-on solutions to fix any problems and is it profitable to invest or modify or improve the comfort of the surface so um, let's start with you know how do we know that a surface is comfortable good um, very good question and so when we think about the uh, surface for a dairy cow and the surface that she lies down on uh, we've broken it down really into four different aspects that are uh, viewed as important for that surface, for, for the dairy cow, in particular in relation to her comfort on that surface. And, and at the top here, as you can see on the slide, you can see that that surface should be soft. And, and so what that means is that when the cow is getting up and down, particularly when she's lying down on that surface, that it's not hard for her. It's, it's easy on her knees as she gets down, so we're not going to see um, uh, hard impact on the surface of that stall where there's going to be an increased chance of uh, injury, of, of bruising on that cow. Uh, it's also going to be soft in terms of that the cow will want to stand on that surface. Um, we want obviously a good standing surface everywhere in the barn. However, we do know that cows will uh, particularly stand in their stalls at certain times, so we want that uh, surface to be soft from that perspective as well. Uh, similarly, uh, we want it to be non-slippery. Uh, this is an area where the cow, that's where she's getting up and down. There's a lot of force there. We've got large animals that are uh, uh, exerting a lot of right. downward force and upward force as they're uh, lying down and as they get up. And if that surface is not, uh, uh, does not have a lot of uh, traction for the animal and is, is very slippery, you're going to increase the risk of the animal slipping, hurting, and falling. Uh, while she's undergoing those actions, which again can increase the risk of injuries in those scenarios. Uh, same thing with abrasion, so we want right. something that's uh, non-abrasive. And, and so uh, one of the particular risk factors for these injuries that we see is an abrasive surface. Obviously, the cow is getting up and down and moving a lot on a surface that is very rough, and particularly over time as the leg, uh, and that particularly the hawk, yeah. and even the point yeah. of the hawk as they, as they rub on that, surface and if that surface is very abrasive that's when we're going to see the um, hair loss starting to occur we're going to see uh, lesions start to develop and swelling start to develop as particularly those lesions might grow they might become infected and and so that's really a reason why we need to consider the abrasiveness of the surface as well and then finally and 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 just as important uh, dryness so no not only does dryness uh, promote uh, a less slippery surface so obviously if something's wet it's going to be more slippery as well but dryness is also very important from a from a cow hygiene and a, uh, a risk for uh, utter infection in the right. cow so we know that bacteria love two things and that's moisture and 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 humidity or sorry temperature and so when you combine those things and you've got moisture on that surface uh particular with organic bedding types your and 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 any kind of fecal uh, matter that might right. be on the, on the surface of salt, you're going to increase the risk of bacterial growth and increase the risk of uh, udder infection in cows. So, so that's why keeping the stall dry and clean is, is also very important from a 
from a comfort and, and a health and welfare perspective of a cow as well. So all these things together need to be uh, considered. So, and, and as we move through some of the things we're going to talk about today, we'll see that some services might be soft and we might actually view them as being quite soft, but they're not necessarily uh, non-slippery or, or, or non-abrasive. Right. So what we really want is have a surface that assembles those four criteria. So what are the options? <laughs> so, so yeah, I guess there's there's a number of options that we have available to us in the dairy industry. Um, uh, and I guess uh, three kind of areas that we'll speak about today are the use of mattresses and stalls, um, the use of uh, bedding, uh, and then we put more bedding. Actually, that first point probably should say mattresses and bedding, and we'll come back to that. Um, a mattress on its own. Uh, is not going to promote all four of those characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be difficult to keep it clean. It's going to be uh, potentially more abrasive and um, also uh, when it becomes wet, it might be more slippery. So um, even though it might be soft, it might not have all those characteristics. So we, we often talk about having some type of bedding source on top of that. We're going to talk about more bedding and, and the impacts that that has on there. And then also uh, a deep bedded solution. So going with uh, solutions where we have lots of bedding uh, in, in, a, in a deep bedded scenario, whether that be with sand or with other mm -hmm. bedding types where, again, um, we, can, we can look at it, we can evaluate from that kind of uh, those four per perspectives. Right. And when you're talking about deep bedding, you're talking even uh, surfaces like sand bedding. Yeah, so yes. sand bedding, uh, in, in whether that be in a free stall or, or even a tie stall um, or other types of bedding materials we can have in a deep bedding scenario. Or, or we can even extrapolate that to uh, compost and, and, and bedded pack type scenarios as well. All right. Um, how about we ask our participants um, what type of surfaces they have? I think it'd be interesting to uh, have a portrait of the situation. Um, we are going to ask the following question. I need to do it. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to ask you what type of surface are your cows lying on? So you have multiple choices, uh, concrete, hard rubber mats, mattresses, deep bedding, or sand. Yeah. So while you're answering, Anne-Marie, do we have any questions so far? All right. I think we're being very clear. All right. Oh, Anne-Marie is informing me that we are 50. Well, there's 54 of you uh, online today, and we have uh, guests in the room today, actually, since we are at, at McGill. It's very interesting. We have uh, one of the, um, of the, the well-known uh, welfare experts in Canada, Dr. Elsa Vassar, and her students. So welcome. And if you do have questions today, you are most welcome to ask them as well. So do we have uh, answers, Anne-Marie? All right. Internet's better. So 8% on concrete, 23% uh, hard rubber mats, 58% mattresses, 12% deep bedding, and 8% sand. So does that look like a portrait that you would have expected? I think so. Yeah, I, um, I think based on surveys, uh, part at, like the cluster project, this this would be a very uh, well representative sample of uh, yeah. dairy producers uh, here in Canada across the country. So, um, no, that's uh, that's good. Um, let's start with uh, we've got different surfaces here, but let's start with mattresses, which seems to be uh, the most popular or the most uh, prevalent type of surface. Um, mattresses appeared on the market about around the mid 90s or something. Did it improve comfort uh, for cows? Well, I guess before a lot of our before mattresses really started to come on the market, a lot of the uh, barns, whether it be tie stall or even free stall barns at that time, had very compact, hard surfaces underneath whatever bedding they might have been using. Like um, concrete? So, like, yeah, like concrete, like uh, hard rubber mats, right. or even uh, compacted um, uh, uh, soil and, and other uh, um, substrates. Uh, and, and so not, uh, not a lot of cushion to those to those uh, to those surfaces, and so in a lot of those cases, there was there was some bedding use, maybe not uh, a lot of bedding use, and 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 uh, the advent of, of mattresses was usually really used to uh, think about providing some more cushion to the animals, particularly ones that were again housed on on a concrete surface or housed on a very hard rubber or other type of hard surface. 
uh, in those facilities. Mm -hmm. um, and so at that time, we started to see Sorry. <laughs> oh, we started to see more research uh, on that. So yeah. looking at, at the time, comparisons uh, between things like these mattresses that were coming onto the market and some of the uh, types of surfaces that were more prevalent at that time, like having a concrete base under the stall. So uh, the data that you see on the screen is actually research from uh, Dr. Jeff Russian uh, from uh, about 15 years ago already, where they were looking at a uh, comparison of a, of a mattress uh, versus concrete. And this is in both cases with a, a small amount of bedding on top of those surfaces. And, and what you can see quite clearly from this data is uh, a difference in terms of, uh, as you look there, the percentage of cows with injuries both uh, to their knees as well as to their hocks. And, and, and they saw that particularly on the front legs but also on the back legs of those animals where they saw more of those injuries on those cows. And I think in this study as well, they saw a change in the behavior of the cows as well with those cows actually spending more time lying down in those uh, softer mattress Indeed. stalls uh, as compared to, again, a concrete, so a very hard uh, base in those stalls. I might have missed it, but was there any bedding? Uh, yes, there was some bedding on top of there. I think they had some straw on top of there, like a very small, or a reasonably small amount, a half a kilo or something. On both surfaces? Yes, on both surfaces okay. in, in the case of that study, yes. So basically uh, adding a mattress on top of concrete resulted in less injuries? Yeah, so they saw basically that, that softness associated with the mattress as opposed to the concrete, right, with an even amount of bedding. They saw that decrease in the amount of injuries that uh, were occurring in that case. I think we have here an example that's more uh, well, that's very recent, actually. What? what, what yeah, and so this is this is an example that was given to me of a of a, a Canadian farm where they actually had a tie stall farm actually where they had um, a a hard uh, rubber base in their stalls, and the producers were. Uh, uh, complaining about the number of injuries that they had on the hawks of their cows in that scenario. And um, again, uh, still bedding on those stalls with, with some bedding on top. Uh, but we see on the uh, left side there, you see a, 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 obviously a, a cow with a, a, an injured hawk there. And, and what they did in this case was they actually added a, a softer um, mat to the surface. In this case, it was a water bed. Um, so again, and we'll come back to some of the differences in softness in a few All moments, right. but uh, one of the things that they saw was that um, with the addition of that, and plus again having that bedding on top of there, they saw a reduction. And again, this is very anecdotal, but this is a reduction that they saw in terms of the, they saw those, those injuries starting to heal and they saw a reduction in the prevalence of those across the herd in that case. All right. Uh, Aside from the, the, the injuries, is there another improvement that we've been measuring from uh, adding mattresses on the surface? Well, I guess, as I, as I mentioned before, in the previous study from, from uh, Dr. Russian, uh, they saw changes in the, the actual standing line behavior of the cows as well. And there's another example here that we've just put up on the screen, and this is from um, actually the same research group at the time, uh, about the same time frame. This is work done by Dr. Derek Haley uh, when he was a, a student yet, where he was looking at um, differences between stalls. So actually a, a smaller, again, a little bit of a stark contrast, a smaller stall that had a concrete base versus a larger stall with a mattress. And we're going to talk about in the next webinar, we'll talk about stall size. Yeah. Um, so the interaction that that has as well. But in this case, uh, we see a clear difference in terms of the usage of the stall. So uh, those cows spending uh, considerably more time, uh, a few hours more a day lying down in those stalls that had the mattresses and less time uh, standing uh, idle, uh, mm -hmm. not doing anything. So again, these are in, these are in tie stalls, this, this research, and so they saw less idle time standing in those stalls. Uh, again, uh, and we talked about this last time, we don't want cows standing around uh, doing nothing, doing right? Nothing, yeah. uh, ideally, cows should be devoting their time to eating. They should be devoting their time to resting and ruminating while they're resting. And if they're not engaged in those things uh, and they're spending time, more time standing, particularly on hard surfaces, that's hard on their feet as well. So and, they can't just yeah. chat and have fun, right? Well, they, 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 they can do that, but they should do that lying down. So, oh, okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> so uh, I think it's pretty convincing that mattresses um, improved. Uh, the comfort of cows. Back in the eight, 90s when they appeared on the market, there were only a couple of options, but nowadays there are plenty of options. Uh, what, 
what's available for dairy producers nowadays? Well, I guess I guess there's there's a whole plethora of, of, of items out there, and, and we don't have time to speak about every one in particular detail and run through the individual research associated with each product or even... Um, but we'll, we'll, I guess we'll broadly talk about some of the different categories that we typically see in the industry um, without getting into specific brands or specific uh, types, even, even real specific on the types of materials mm -hmm. that are used. Broadly, we can kind of classify them. And again, we talked about the use of concrete. Uh, and there's still, as we saw in our survey, we still have a number of producers using concrete as a base for their stalls, having hard rubber mats. Um, we have other types of uh, mattresses that have uh, either a foam inside or some type of geotextile uh, product uh, within the mattress itself. There's other types of rubber, uh, more softer type, that have some kind of, a little bit of sponge to them. Um, we also see, as I mentioned before, the water mattresses or water beds mm -hmm. uh, that have water uh, kept inside or uh, gel mattresses. So they're, they're special composite gel material that are inside, again, uh, designed with the idea of uh, promoting softness and, and promoting comfort. Um, one of the things that we have on the slide there, as you see on the top, and it goes back to what we mentioned earlier, it says mattress plus bedding options. Yes. And, and so one of the, um, the challenges for us to think about, and going back to those four characteristics that we want when we, when we think about the lying surface of the cow, is we want it to be soft, we want it to be dry, we want it to be non-abrasive and we want it to be non-slippery. And, and really, uh, some of these products are better than others in terms of being uh, into softness. softness. And, 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 but if you think about those three other characteristics, really, um, it's very difficult to manage those uh, with just those, those materials themselves. And so that's where having bedding on top of those, and we'll talk about the amounts coming up in a few moments, but having that bedding on top of it becomes very important for promoting those other aspects that are important from a comfort perspective. Pretty neat water gel. I mean, I'm almost jealous. Like it looks more comfy than in my own bed. <laughs> um, is there, like, how much do all these options cost? How much? Yeah, and so that's, that's, that's another big factor that we have to consider when we think about yeah. uh, installing these in, a, in, our, in our facilities because they all come at a different price. And, and I think we've kind of categorized these on the next slide in terms of differences in terms of their cost. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, so yeah, obviously with, with little investment, uh, either concrete, just a base, uh, or a hard rubber base, uh, obviously uh, on the cheaper end of things, so anywhere from very little to uh, maybe $100 a cow, then we get into the more moderate price, $150 to $250 in terms of some of the foam and geotextile mattresses. Um, and then even more expensive, some of the uh, other types of systems that are out there, uh, whether it be soft rubber, or water, or, or gel mattresses, uh, ranging from, again, uh, anywhere from about $250 mm -hmm. to $500 per count. Again, these prices are going to vary depending on uh, location, depending on size of orders and all these kind of things. Um, so we have to think hard because these things are uh, obviously uh, costs that producers yes. uh, might be incurring. We, we need to think hard about uh, the implications that these have on, on cow comfort right. uh, particularly. Um, do the most uh, expensive ones are more comfortable? Uh, not necessarily. <laughs> so it's a tough question. Um, and again, I think, uh, and we're going to come back to this probably over and over, is, is the fact that a lot of it comes back to maintenance. Maintenance of the surface itself and maintenance of the, say, as we've already talked about, the bedding on top of that. And, and one of the big factors, actually, um, that can... Uh, influence that the quality of that surface is not only uh, obviously the cost and maybe how soft it might be initially, but as as how long those mattresses hold up over time and, and the durability of those over time. So then my next question is, are the most expensive ones the most durable? Well, again, <laughs> it, it, it's it remains to be seen. So a lot of uh, in a lot of cases, I'd say there, there's there's going to be variability in terms of how durable they are. Uh, the the long term durability is really going to be uh, dictated by how we maintain those mattresses and how we how we keep those mattresses. 
Um, the, the figure we put on the slide here is, is thinking about one mattress per stall per two cow lifespans. And, and again, we're, we're thinking of a cow that hopefully lasts for a few lactations, right? Of course. <laughs> so not, not one that uh, only lasts for two lactations. But if we're thinking of a cow that lasts maybe for uh, three, four, five lactations, hopefully we can get, uh, say, eight years out of, out, of a, out of a mattress, maybe up to 10 years. By the time we typically get to the end, and, and I've seen this myself walking to barns, you walk into a barn and, and they've got mattresses that are 10 years old or, or older, and you start to see some of the mattresses falling apart, you know that that's just the tip of the iceberg in that case in terms of, yes, they're, they're starting to fall apart, but at the same time, we know that the compression, the, the softness of those mattresses has started to really rapidly decline. The, the surface itself is going to become more abrasive. And so we know that with oh. any material, as it, as it gets rubbed on itself, it's going to become more abrasive and it's going to be tougher on, on the legs of the cows uh, in those scenarios as well. So very important as well then not, not only to make sure that we have a good surface, but that we also maintain it properly right. and replace it as, as necessary as, as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, for options that don't involve mattresses, what do we have? So I guess, I guess, yeah, and, and we, we briefly touched on this at the beginning, um, we can go to bedding-only type options as well. So we don't need to have a solid base under the animals. We could have a stall that's built with basically um, uh, some kind of well-drained base and then have a deep bedding scenario on top of that. And, and, and really in, in the industry right now, the gold standard for those deep bedding scenarios is, is a sand uh, deep bedded scenario. We can also have other types of deep bedding. People have uh, used uh, wood products like uh, sawdust or wood shavings, mm -hmm. uh, used even straw um, in a deep bed scenario, used uh, byproducts, uh, recycled manure solids, uh, all kinds of options there uh, for us to have a deep bed scenario. And typically we think about the deep bedded options uh, only in freestall scenarios. Right. But uh, we also see uh, producers adapting tie stalls to deep bedding scenarios as well. Some of the challenges there, though, become manure handling. And so right. a lot of tie stalls aren't, ha or tie stall facilities aren't designed to handle uh, more liquidy type manure or manure with um, finer particles, finer bedding particles. And so uh, we need to, in those cases, make sure that we can handle or make sure the, the barn system can handle the the, the product that's coming out of the uh, stalls in those scenarios as well. So we've covered pretty much all the various types of surfaces that we see in the barns uh, nowadays. Now I want to throw in the question, <laughs> the one I think our participants uh, would like an answer for, which one is the best surface for our cows? So. Um, a very good question, a very simple question, but one that doesn't have a, uh, I guess, a, a very simple answer. How disappointing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a very, very political of me, right? So um, we know that, again, I want, and, and when people are considering different options for them, particularly in your own farm, we know that those four areas are, are key from the comfort of the cow, in right. terms of softness, in terms of dryness, um, being not slippery and, and being not abrasive. not abrasive. And so those are the things that we need to consider. Um, as I just mentioned, we talked about something like a deep bedded sand scenario. From the research that we have, um, uh, both in controlled studies, in uh, survey studies, uh, on-farm studies, we know that sand uh, performs the best in a deep bedded scenario, particularly if it's well maintained, it's kept soft. Um, it's good from an utter health perspective. It's good from a lameness perspective. It seems to be um, well used by the cows in terms of uh, uh, stall usage. So all very good things. The challenge then becomes is um, can every producer utilize sand? Well, no, not every barn is set up to, to exactly. handle it. Not every manure system can handle it. Um, uh, not everybody has a good source of that sand as well and, 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 and an a, uh, economical source. So, right. so in that case, that might not be the best uh, stall surface for you in your barn. And so you might need to consider other options. And so we need to consider uh, really how the current design of the barn, whether or not uh, producers are willing to make adjustments to the barn, uh, they, the options they have for sourcing bedding, and all, all of those things are very important for them in terms of coming up with uh, the ideal scenario for them on their farm. I guess 
so every every dairy producer has to give it a lot of thought based on yes the comfort for the cow but also how it's going to be manageable and what the availability and cost of bedding or, or material and but is there a criteria uh, that should influence them maybe uh, based on the four criteria of comfort of evaluating com uh, comfort of the surface well I think like I said we can manage we can manage um, a lot of the uh, say the cleanliness the dryness the, mm -hmm. the slipperiness and and the abrasion factors through bedding management and and so bedding management has to be part of our stall management uh, yeah. mantra it, it has to be part of what we do anyways so the one thing that we can do in deciding what system we're going to start with is to actually think about the softness of the surface okay. think about how uh, hard that is, and 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 then and then use that to start making decisions where we're going to start, and then how we're gonna, how we're going to go from there. But uh, how do we measure softness? So I guess I guess there's a variety of ways. One is simply to walk into a stall and and drop down on your knees and hope that it's not so hard that your kneecaps bust. Um, uh, Talking about experience yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Um, we, we, we look for wetness and bedding doing that. We look at uh, hardness. And, and yeah, if, if you fall down on your knees and it hurts, so well, that's, that's a pretty good indicator. Again, that's, that's a pretty still an anecdotal. Some people might say maybe some people have tougher knees than I do, and, and they might uh, have no problem falling down on a, on a concrete Sounds surface. Sounds like you don't feel like yeah. doing it anymore. <laughs> no. Um, but uh, there are some more uh, objective ways of actually measuring the hardness of a, of a ground surface. And, and and uh, we're actually going to demonstrate that for you oh, today. Oh, how handy. Yes. <laughs> We've got everything yeah. needed. Yes, actually, uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Steve Adam, who, uh, who is the person who I get, uh, teach the webinars in the French version of it with, he's here with us today. And we're going to move the webcam on to him. And uh, maybe, Trevor, you can, while we are setting up, you can explain a little bit what is the tool that we are going to use to measure softness of different Surfaces? Sounds good. Yeah. So um, what uh, what Steve is going to be demonstrating today is a tool that uh, he's been using at Lacta for evaluating different uh, bedding surfaces, and so um, or or stall surfaces. And what it is is called a Clegg impact tester, and yeah. I think originally designed for uh, detecting hardness of soil. Um, but uh, basically, in this case, we're, we're using it to look at the hardness of, of different surfaces. And it really involves a, it's a fairly simple design, a, about a 10 kilo hammer that you, you basically lift up and drop down. And, um, uh, and it actually gives a reading in terms of uh, what's called a clagging impact value in terms of the hardness and, and uh, force on that surface. And basically, a higher value means a harder surface. And so we're going to be... Uh, demonstrating that yes. here, uh, and, and Julie will describe what they're doing here and what they're testing in, in terms of this. Yeah, so Steve is not Mike, so I will uh, describe it a little bit. So basically, Steve is putting the clagging impact tester on a rubber mat. Uh, so, so what you have in your barn, for those of you who have a rubber mat, and basically we're going to lift the weight and let it drop down. So sorry for those who are, <laughs> those of you in the room here, it might be a little, uh, a little loud. So we'll... All right, so we have a value here, which is a Clegg impact unit. Is that All right, and we have a value of 29.5. Oh, you have a mic for Steve? All right, do you want to... Okay, so 29.5, do you want to redo it? Are we going to have the same thing? Because uh, I don't trust you for the first time. No, I can do it again. <laughs> oh, I think we needed to reset it. <laughs> Do you want me to tell you how to use your machine? <laughs> All right. Oops. Technical difficulties. <laughs> All right. So this time we have 31.5. So Steve, do you how do, like we have a different value normally do you yeah. do it many times? Yeah, we do it uh, five times and we take the average at the end. Okay. And uh, 30, it's around the, the, the value for the, uh, a, hard a rubber mat, what yeah. you'd see normally. Yeah. So we, we don't really know if it's hard or if it's not. So can you do it on a, presumably a softer surface? Yeah, and we will do it on the, it's a... Uh, Geotextile mat? Okay. 
So we want to reset this. So the geotech site, is that how you call it in English? So there's a, basically a foam under... A rubber-filled rubber uh, mattress uh, underneath a, uh, uh, a cover. Uh, yes. Fabric co in this case, I'm not sure, Steve, which one it is, which... With What's that? With, With the, pad the pad on top, yes. yes. Yeah. All right, so we'll see what we have here. There's a difference. Zero. Do it again. Is this machine working? <laughs> oh, 4.2 this time. Okay, so basically zero for what? Like, is this something that that indicates that it's softer than than the rubber mat? The mic is there. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a little bit. Uh, when we have zero, it's around the the the, the pasture. Okay, it's like the pasture. Yeah. It's something you'd and, see in the pasture. Uh, here we can see the the, the, the mattress mm -hmm. is around zero bit between uh, three, and uh, that's softer than the, the rubber mat. All right. Now, if you have a rubber mat, what can you do to improve the softness of your surface? Uh, as you said, we can improve the, the softness with uh, bedding, and we will try it uh, with uh, all right. Around uh, one and a half inches of bedding. Okay. So we're going to put some uh, straw on top of the uh, rubber mat and then uh, look at how it changes. So as you heard before, the the, the original test uh, or values were around 30 for uh, the, rubber, the mat. rubber mat and about uh, zero to four for the uh, uh, mattress that we tried. So now yes. with some straw on top of the rubber mat, we'll see what kind of difference we have. 5.7. Let's so do it again. First test, 5.7, so considerably lower. 8.2. So, Steve, it's increasing a little bit, I guess, because it's compacting the 10 now. So, imagine a, a cow knee dropping on the floor. It's 10. Yeah. I guess a, a cow lying down and, and dropping on the floor would compact the bedding at first, but then at one point, I think... Yeah, and, and you're going to see certain things like, in this case, straw, which is going to compact a little bit more. At first, you might put it in the, in the stall, and it's quite fluffy, but as it becomes uh, compacted a bit, it's going okay. to become a little bit harder on the surface. But you can see that's a dramatic difference between yeah. just having no bedding versus having a, a thin layer of compacted straw bedding on, on top. Of that, uh, so surface. the challenge is really to keep the bedding. Yeah, keeping the bedding on that surface and keeping it uh, in, in sufficient amount that we see uh, that difference. Yes, and having it everywhere in the stall too. Yeah. All right. So that's pretty impressive. And actually, Steve, uh, thank you very much, Steve, for the demo. I think that's pretty convincing on my part anyway. Uh, and uh, Steve uh, tested different types of surfaces. And uh, actually, uh, on the next slide, we are showing the results that he obtained. Can you yes. discuss them? Yeah, so on average, as you saw there, the, the numbers that uh, typically result from doing this uh, Clegg test on, say, hard surfaces like concrete uh, are going to be at anywhere from 40 to 100. So very high numbers indicating very hard surfaces, very little yeah. uh, uh, or a lot of resistance, sorry. Uh, hard rubber as, uh, around there as well. The, this, the surface we just tried here, uh, the rubber mat had a little bit lower, but again, quite high. Once we go to more softer surfaces, as we actually tested there, um, uh, so anything from foam to softer rubber mats to uh, even uh, deep bedded sand, if it's being wetted and it's being compacted yeah. in a stall. So again, this comes back to maintenance and why stall maintenance is so important. Um, uh, sand, if it's not maintained well and it's hard, can become like concrete if, if, if it's not uh, replenished and, and maintained enough. And, and so these other surfaces as well uh, even have lower. So we think about pasture, we think of other deep bedding, all very low in terms of um, their uh, uh, hardness and, and are right. more compressible. So after, after what we've seen just now and considering that softness might be a pretty important criteria for, for the comfort of the surface, um, can you now answer my question, which one is the best mattress specifically? 
still, again, again, we're going to start with that um, that initial softness as being important. So, yeah, we can make decisions based on the softness there. But we also know that they still are not all um, a softness of zero. And they also uh, still need those other uh, attributes in terms right. of dryness and, and, and abrasiveness, et cetera, that we need to consider. And so... Um, we need to think about what are what are aspects that are going to promote that, and we talked about bedding already, um, and and so this is just another example. This is actually more uh, uh, trials that have been done by Steve, actually looking at how simply by adding bedding on top of different surfaces, or, or sorry, on top of a surface, can influence the the softness, and and so. Uh, as we get up to a higher level of bedding, and again, this is in this case, say, up to about eight centimeters, so just over three inches of, mm -hmm. of bedding on Which top of there. Uh, actually, what, what he found is that basically the type of bedding didn't even matter. Basically, we all get down to that, that, that zero clegg value, so basically a, a nice soft surface for that animal to lie down on. And we know, again, from studies that um, with that amount of bedding on top, mm -hmm. we're also promoting a very... Um, dry surface, if, again, if it's maintained well, and, and non-abrasive surface in that case as well. I think it'd be interesting to uh, go to our participants and find out how much bedding there is in the stalls of their cows. And actually, uh, the question that we're going to ask you is how much bedding there is in the stall just before you're about to add some more. So not when you've just added some, because as we know, uh, it might go off a little bit, so we might be attacked. <laughs> Everything's being <laughs> okay. Everything holds by scotch tape here, <laughs> since we <laughs> since we set up very quickly. <laughs> all right. Well, we're all safe and sound. <laughs> we're good. So we have the question going. Yes. So how Excellent. much bedding? Uh, oh, it's been we we were already uh, waiting for the. Okay, we just threw it. Oh, wait. so how much bedding remains in your stall spans before? You just you're just about to add some more. So is it less than two centimeters or in inch less than an inch if you prefer between two and five, between five and eight, eight and ten, or ten and above? Anne Marie, yeah. be, 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 while yes. they're answering, you have a question. They have a question while the people are answering this one. So someone is asking, have there been any tests done with peat moss? Peat moss. In terms of the softness of, of peat moss, or in terms uh, in terms of softness, or in terms of uh, quantity needed. We just asked if there is okay. some test done. Yes. For yeah, so um, again, in the interest of time, actually, Steve had a number of slides actually showing us different options, and so uh, he did actually look at peat moss and found that to get down to that zero uh, Clegg value, similar to what I showed for the straw and for the uh, shavings, you need just a, actually a little bit more, so about 10 centimeters, so about four inches of, um, uh, of uh, material on, on, on the stall to, to get to that softness level. So those level. preliminary tests indicate that maybe it would come back a little more, we need a little more, but Good. it's very preliminary. We, we will yeah, do, yeah, yeah, exactly. So other tests will be performed, so don't take it yeah. for <laughs> so <laughs> So we can see that if we look at our, and again, a lot of our producers were using different types of mattresses or rubber mats. Uh, we're seeing that most of the usage of uh, bedding is, is uh, in my opinion, relatively low. Uh, so less, less than an inch less, for 35%? Yeah, so about a third less than an inch. And then uh, getting into a better range, I would say, is, is between that two and five centimeters, so one to two inches of, of bedding on top of that with some producers, probably our, our deep bedded producers, uh, having much more uh, bedding obviously available to them in, the, right. in those stalls. Right. Um, so, um, Trevor, you were pretty convincing that we need bedding to... Um, to have all the four criteria for a, a comfortable surface. But having enough bedding, uh, does it improve comfort enough to be able to measure an impact at the cow level? Yeah, de definitely. And, and this is where we have very good uh, controlled research to, to show these differences. And so on your screen, what you have is a trial done by uh, colleagues, uh, former colleagues of mine at the University of British Columbia, uh, Dr. Cassandra Tucker, who's now in the United States at UC Davis, and, oh. and Dr. Dan Weary from the UBC Animal Welfare Program. And, and what uh, this was part of Dr. Dr. Tucker's uh, PhD research. And 
what she found in this study was uh, even between uh, zero uh, bedding, so on, on the stall, on a, on a mattress, and this is in a free stall, uh, on, a, on a, um, a geotextile mattress versus having one kilogram, so uh, uh, just one kilogram over the whole stall, they saw in terms of, and this was uh, shavings, wood shavings, they saw <coughs> an increase uh, uh, in lying time. Yeah, they saw an increase in lying time of just over uh, about, I think it was about an hour and a half per day in those cows are just over an hour in terms of increase. Between one, uh, zero and one uh, kilo. Just between zero and one kilo. And then they went for an extreme value in this case, and you see seven and a half, which is yeah. almost like what you'd have in a deep bedded scenario. Yeah. And then you see even a higher amount of resting time in those yeah. cows. So much more dramatic. So 7.5, as you say, is a lot of bedding, and bedding has a cost. It, it involves management. Uh, with lower, and we've seen that many of our participants don't have this amount of bedding, you know, which is pretty typical. It's it's okay. Uh, do you see an improvement with less than? Well, we between <coughs> zero and one, but yeah, definitely. Um, so actually, in a follow-up study by Dr. Tucker from 2009, and this was actually done with tie stalls, where they looked at adding shavings as well as adding straw, and and they did a dose response where they added just a uh, kilogram at a time basically to those stalls to look at the impact that it had. And you can see in this case more modest increases in terms of lying time. Um, so going across a spectrum of amounts, but you see basically that as you put more shavings in, and uh, particularly as you add more straw into, uh, in this case, tie stalls, they saw um, these these uh, sequential increases in, in terms of the lying time and the usage of the stalls mm -hmm. in that scenario. All right. Okay, uh, now you've talked about sand uh, before as being a gold standard. Um, what about sand? Is it even better? Well, I guess sand and any deep, deep bedding scenario, we actually see even uh, greater improvement. So uh, part of our cluster research that we've shown, um, um, <laughs> yes. part of the cluster research actually results uh, recently suggest that... Sorry. <laughs> We're having technical difficulties, sorry. Yes. Um, we're trying to show you some there data. There you go, yeah. But basically what we see is, uh, and this is data from um, uh, Laura Solano from uh, University of Calgary suggesting that in, in free stalls we actually see increased uh, lying time in sand bedded stalls as well as stalls that had um, at least a, a few centimeters of bedding on top of them. And, and this is something that we've repeated actually in another study more recently with robotic milk cows as well, where oh, we yeah. see basically any deep bedded scenario, we see more resting time in cows versus those on, on mattresses, irregardless of, of bedding use actually on those All right. I think uh, we scenarios. have a question, uh, Trevor, sorry for coming. In fact, we have two people asking the same question. Is there a, um, a difference between long straw and chopped straw? In, in terms of cushion. Or, softness. Yeah, yeah, softness. Um, as you can see, sorry, we, we did go over that uh, previous slide fairly uh, uh, rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Maybe um, I can go back. We can go back to it very quickly. No. Oh, there. Sorry. And so there, in that case, you see chop straw and long straw. And and basically what you see is that the, the chop straw actually has a, um, uh, becomes more compressible. Uh, with very little amounts, actually. So because it's because it is fine, it actually uh, is much more uh, hard um, in low amounts um, as compared to say the longer chop straw or longer straw. However, as you get up to what we would consider sufficient amounts of straw or in, in high amounts of straw on that surface, it doesn't actually matter at that time point. Right. So they basically both get down to the same level. So you're using very very minimal amounts. Yes, uh, having it chopped very short is going to be more compressible and 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 harder on on, on the surface or, or making the surface. So maybe as long as long as it's there and there's enough, basically yeah. that's the whole point. And then after it's a preference or management preference. Um, so I um, we we want a lot of bedding. That's basically the whole point of it. But then I think we need to reinforce the importance of having dry bedding. It's not only having a lot. Yeah, so maintenance, and I think um, uh, we could spend a whole bunch of time, but we're running out of time, so we'll have to be uh, keep our words short on this, but we know that maintenance of bedding is hugely important and, and keeping bedding fresh. And so the, the data you have here is some data, uh, some preference study work done by colleagues again at the University of British Columbia where they showed nearly a five-hour difference in terms of time that cows were willing to spend lying down. And these were 
the number is actually, the, the resting time is quite high for the dry bedding, and that's, uh, these were dry cows, so these weren't lactating cows uh, in the case of this study. Um, they've actually replicated this with lactating cows and saw similar effects. But in this case, they saw almost a five-hour difference between how much time they would be willing to spend lying down in dry bedding versus wet bedding. So again, simple things. And this is a main, This doesn't have to cost us money exactly. in terms of making sure that stalls are clean, making sure that they're dry. Um, another piece of uh, data that we're, we're not going to show you, but we can talk about, particularly in our deep bedding scenarios, is keeping those stalls level and flat. Okay. And, and that, again, has been shown, um, uh, again, by, by colleagues in, at UBC to show have a dramatic impact on how much time cows are willing to spend lying down. If, if stalls are kept flat, they're kept level, cows are going to be willing to use them. If they, if they start to dish out and become okay. hard, then cows become less willing to, to use those uh, All right. surfaces. So in terms of different types of bedding, are there characteristics that we need to consider with what are the options? Well, I guess, I guess um, again, similar to the mattress types, we, we've got a whole bunch of options out there for producers in terms of different types of bedding available to us. And again, they all have their uh, pluses and minuses. They're all going to be uh, come at a different cost. And again, that's going to depend on whether or not you're growing maybe some of the mm -hmm. substrates you might use as bedding, whether or not you have to buy those uh, substrates. So um, they all have their 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 uh, positives and the negatives for individual producers, and and so it really comes down to what is available to producers, yep. how economic they can make those different types of bedding, and then think about how do they use those beddings, whether it be in a deep bedded scenario or in a in a mattress type scenario, how do they use those to the, to optimize basically the comfort for the cow in those stalls. Mm -hmm. And in the guide, uh, there's a table with all the characteristics for the different types of bedding, so you might want to go uh, and look have a look at it to make yourself uh, an idea now um yes okay so we got 30 minutes left now is time Pl plenty of time oh, we got lots yeah. of time plenty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. have a sip yeah <laughs> all right yes we Maybe have a one question of the participant how seven kilos of straw look like is it big? what does it look yeah, like yeah. in terms of depth Okay. Seven kilos. So in that case, so the seven kilos in that study, uh, as I mentioned, was actually shavings, wood shavings. So that looks a little different than uh, seven kilograms of straw. So seven mm -hmm. kilograms of straw might be quite a bit in, in a stall. No, I, I'm joking at being too high. But um, uh, seven and a half kilograms of shavings in the stalls is, is, is pretty thick. I think we're probably in that 10 to 15 centimeter range um, in, in terms of thickness. Uh, straw at that amount, you're probably doubling that, or, uh, <laughs> if not tripling that. Um, uh, and and actually, we're, we were going to talk about that at some point, um, uh, basically uh, looking at the depth versus the weight of the bedding. And and so we a lot of studies to, to try quantify it, they've used weight. Uh, but but from what we've showed you with the Clegg test and, and some of the practical experience, particularly Steve's been working on looking at um, the hardness or, the, or, sorry, the softness uh, of adding bedding, it's really the thickness of the bedding that seems to be the easiest thing for us to manage and look at. And, and so some of our uh, on-farm work recently, and, and as we mentioned before, have we've been evaluating that bedding depth rather than the amount because it's very it's quite difficult for us to quantify that amount. Yeah, in and that, the depth, uh, the, the the weight related to the depth varies according to the mm -hmm. type of bedding. So it's it's yeah. more. Uh, common to talk about the depth. Um, now, for the few minutes that we have left, I think it would be interesting to go into barns and look at examples of how we can set things up to maybe improve softness of the, well, softness or improve the comfort in general of the surface. I suggest that first we go visit this barn, which is located in the Bolseria, 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 both area, sorry, I'm confused in my French and English brain here, um, which is basically just southeast of Quebec City. And uh, this is a Tysol barn, uh, about a 75 cow barn, approximately. And um, basically, what did they do there? Yeah, so so what we'll do, we're, what we'll do is show you um, some modifications that this farm has done to uh, improve the, the comfort of their cows. And, and so this is a, a tie stall farm that um, uh, actually had uh, a, a mattress bedded system, um, tie stalls that were uh, relatively well-sized for their cows, so quite wide, quite long, 
Uh, so, and, and again, we'll talk about some of those things in our next webinar, but uh, for all intents and purposes, fit their cows quite well. Um, and as you can see, there's actually, in this case, quite a bit of bedding on, on the stall. Yeah, so this it looks is, comfy. You know? uh, and so this is actually what they were uh, dealing with. And, but one of their challenges is that they, they noticed that they were having a, a difficult time keeping that bedding on the surface and keeping it fresh in front, underneath the cows. And, and as a result of that, and part of the research, they were involved in, in a research project where um, there was an actually an evaluation of their cows and, and the hawks of their cows. And, and one of the things that became clear to them was that they had a lot more of these hawk injuries than they had actually thought they had had and, 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 and became quite concerned about that and started thinking about and looking at, okay, what are the things that we can be doing to try to mitigate uh, the development of those hawk injuries in, our, in, in their cows? And, and so they started thinking about uh, different options, consulting their veterinarian as well as other people in terms of what might be uh, the best scenario for them. What were the options in front of them? Well, I guess I guess they were provided a variety of options, uh, like like going to deep bedding, like going to sand, um, uh, taking the mattresses out, those kind of things. Uh, the producer, uh, from my understanding, uh, wasn't that interested in going down that route, no. and and so wanted to think about different ways of sure they could keep that bedding in the stalls and and so uh, the the route that they actually took was to uh, implement a, a bedding keeper so something to keep the uh, uh, the bedding there for the, for the cows. I know that one of the worries that they had with the bedding keepers is that they were worried that it keep more of the manure than the bedding at the yeah and and so one of the one of the risks with with bedding keepers uh, particularly in a uh, in a tie stall scenario like that is uh, the fact that uh, material does not come out of the stall as easily, mm -hmm. uh, uh, particularly if it's installed right on the surface. We might hold moisture, actually. If, if, if it's a uh, mattress stall, it might hold moisture at the back end of the stall, which, again, is uh, something we don't want to do. We don't want uh, manure and moisture accumulating at the back of the stall. And, and they wanted something that they could easily clean out completely. And okay. so, the, so the the design actually what you see here is a kind of a novel design that you see here on the screen, where a bedding keeper that could be actually removed quite easily. So basically, just a um, a, a three inch aluminum pipe, uh, which is basically attached to the end curb with uh, these little um, uh, kind of flanges, I guess, that fit into a, a little pocket there. You can see there, yep. so they could actually just lift it out if they wanted to clean those stalls out. Completely, so it's removable. Uh, they can remove it, yeah, without having to undo all kinds of bolts or screws or whatever else have you. They could actually take it out quite easily and, and manage their stalls in, in that manner. Is this commercially available? Um, I actually don't know in this case. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll tell you. Uh, that. Yeah, so... <laughs> Actually, uh, no, they, they, it's basically a prototype yeah. that they've invent, so, invented. Yeah. So again, yeah, in this case, and that, that would be my best <laughs> guess, is that they would have they would have had uh, an equipment manufacturer or a, uh, a, yeah, a fabricator to yeah. um, come yeah. up with this for them. And, and what it really does is, again, it allows, it allows for cleaning. They're able to maintain it uh, at their, basically at the frequency they want to. Um, it's going to uh, allow drainage out of it. Um, and I think we see that on the next stall. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we can see that there's actually, a, maybe it's not a great picture, but you can actually see a gap underneath where uh, material can come out of uh, as well. Yeah, and this is basically just to show that how, how they lift it, basically. Yeah. They just lift it and, and clean, and every day they just remove the, the, the cow pies and, and add some straw uh, once a week or so, yeah, and that's basically it. Yeah, well, they're adding. I think in this case, they add a little bit of straw daily. They do a larger that's cleanout it. weekly, and then and then for a full cleanout, uh, which they do a few times a year, they just actually take that rail right out, clean them out, and pressure wash the whole yeah. stall down. And yeah, and only a few times a week, actually. Uh, a year. year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's but it but it but it allows them to do that with minimal effort. Yeah, which is nice. and so basically, we can see on the picture here that they're using straw, but at first they had tried with. Uh, yeah, they shaving. they had tried some other things, and then this is again this is something that uh, producers I encourage producers to think about different options. And in this yeah. case, they tried actually start with more of a, a base of shavings and mixing some wood shavings in with their straw. But one of the challenges with that, particularly in this scenario, 
is that those wood shavings actually start to compact and get wet and actually plug up kind of the back end of the stall. And I think uh, the producers weren't happy with that in that they scenario. They didn't like the smell. Yeah, yeah, anything. they start to, yeah, the urine and, and it starts to, any any urine that might be on the stall might start to build up in those wood shavings. And again, that's, that's a breeding back mm -hmm. ground for bacteria and, and not ideal for the cows. In the end, the end result is that it, it worked. Uh, cows look very comfortable and, and lying down here. And actually, uh, I visited this farm uh, with our group. Uh, and, and as you can see, they, they've only put the bedding keeper for half of the barn. And you can see that this half of the barn is where the cows are lying. And you can see that it's cutting pretty much where the cows are standing. Those cows. Very, very scientific observation. It's, <laughs> it's not, but no. it was pretty amazing. <laughs> I like, I like. Yeah, no, and I think good stories. No, and, and this is one of those ones where I think uh, the producers actually saw it on their cows. Actually, and again, we'll be very anecdotal. I think even the next slide, like the producers uh, noted personally that they saw an improvement in the legs of their cows. Now, not every cow magically suddenly had beautiful looking legs and no hawk injuries anymore, but there was an improvement that was seen over time. They started to see some of those chronic uh, injuries starting to heal up a bit and 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 the prevention of new uh, injuries from, from occurring in those cows. I like fairy tale stories, yeah. you know. <laughs> All right, so now let's move on to another barn, which is a freestall barn located in Warwick, which is in the center of the province or just about near Victoriaville, for those of you who know where this is in the province of Quebec. Uh, what happened there? So, so this is a, a freestall barn where, um, again, that uh, had been designed for uh, from the producer's perspective, for, for good comfort, um, uh, they had, again, they had a mattress-based stall that uh, they thought could uh, work quite well. Uh, however, the mattresses were starting to get on in age, mm -hmm. and so the producers noticed that. They noticed the uh, level of, of leg injuries starting to increase in their cows, uh, more lameness than they wanted to see in their cows, and so they started thinking about what are the options that they had yeah. for... Um, uh, either going to new mattresses or, or thinking about other options that they might have, might have. So what they did is actually after some consultation and looking around for different ideas, they actually decided to uh, go with the deep bedding scenario. And so actually remove the mattresses from the stalls and actually cut out the concrete so that basically they left a curb at the back of the stall. So rather than uh, basically just creating it out of a, a out of a solid base that mm -hmm. was there so underneath that mattress. So they actually cut out uh, the concrete that was underneath there, left the curb at the back. Similar to what you see in the picture here, this is just an example of of, of what a deep bedded stall might look exactly. like in terms of that curb. And and then uh, started to to fill that uh, with bedding in that scenario. And 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 um, in this case, the the producers wanted uh, options, so they 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 grow uh, they grow beans, so they grow soybeans on their farm, and 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 wanted to use soybean straw, but they exactly. also wanted other options, whether that be other types of organic bedding, or even to think about maybe going to sand bedding exactly. if if it uh, was potential for them. But in this case, they have uh, soy straw, which they have and they would like to use, so they started using it. They chop it up quite fine. Yes. Uh, uh, soy straw can be quite abrasive in itself, particularly if it's long. Um, uh, more abrasive than regular straw, so the, f the finer it's chopped is uh, sometimes better. Uh, and so what, they, they, what they've done is actually use that in their stalls, and they actually use it with a, a lime. Uh, so they add some lime into that uh, mix as well uh, to keep the... Um, uh, keep it a little bit acidic and, and prevent uh, help prevent some bacterial growth in, in those stalls as well. Yes, and their thought was that basically this material is going to go back in the field in the end and the lime will be useful for their crops. Yeah. So basically they're just returning what they're taking from the land. Yeah, so and, 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 and they, they've been very, uh, very happy with this again, similar to the, the, the previous, or, um, they're adding bedding probably once a week. Um, um, and, and, and finding that uh, the cows are, are performing quite well in terms of this environment. They saw similar to the previous farm. Again, this is very anecdotal, but uh, within a, a number of weeks of moving on to this uh, system, they actually saw uh, a dramatic change where they actually started, and to my knowledge, they actually started with a certain number of stalls in their barn. Exactly. And, and, and they actually did this and then let the cows actually show them 
kind of what they preferred. And, exactly. and what they found was that the cows actually started to fight more and were fighting for those stalls. And so they were actually trying to lie down in that stall. And they actually saw too much aggression and dominance behavior between their cows in that case. And so then they decided to, to move on and, and, and increase the number of stalls. And, and after that, they really saw everything kind of level off and being uh, uh, best for their cows in that scenario. Cool. So they, they saw an impact on, on lameness, less lameness? Yeah, so, so from my understanding, yeah, they saw less uh, injuries in their cows. They saw less lameness as well. All right. Do we have a question, Anne-Marie? Yes or no? Uh, yes, I have a question. Do you have any suggestion for keeping bedding in free stalls, stalls you, that use mattresses? Yeah, so again, um, and I think this is something we brushed over that we had chatted about earlier that we were going to mention, but in the example of, for the tie stall with the bedding keeper, uh, that is our biggest challenge actually. Uh, in, a, in a free stall scenario, particularly where we have mattresses, and, and again, uh, it doesn't matter what type of mattress. Some 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 hold uh, bedding a little bit easier than others. My experience is that some actually are more difficult to keep uh, bedding on properly. So things like water beds are quite difficult to keep a, an appropriate amount of bedding on top of those. And and because it's because of the nature of, of the movement, it actually comes okay. off. And, and so in those scenarios, we need to think about how do we keep appropriate amounts of bedding on top. And 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 there's more and more interest in things like bedding keepers. Um, and again, even in freestyle, freestyles. Oh yeah, for sure. And I've seen I've seen a variety. So the the example we showed you is one option. There's uh, people have tried different uh, products, whether they're plastic uh, piping like PVC piping or uh, pieces of wood uh, or um, in this case aluminum uh, bars uh, at 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 the end of the stall. So all options. Uh, my recommendation is. Uh, uh, you can try something on a, on a small subset exactly. of stalls and see how that works for you. Um, one of the challenges, I guess, and cautions is that um, if you've got really high base stalls, so um, one of the things that we mm -hmm. know is that cows don't like really high steps. Right. And, 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 and so the higher steps are, the, the worse it is for from a cow because they okay. don't like making a high step, whether that be into a holding area, whether that be into a crossover alley or into their stalls. And so um, if your stalls are only four to six inches, um, then adding maybe a couple inches on top of that might not be so bad. But if your stalls are already 8 to 10 inches off the uh, floor level of the cow, it might, be an uh, it, it might be an obstacle. And so again, that's why you can try it, but, but really watch the behavior of the cows and take a look at uh, what you're, you see in terms of a change in behavior in okay. those animals and if they're actually using those stalls very well. It's basically trial and error, and it doesn't always work the no, first and, time. And, and, and Something like that in that scenario doesn't have to be a huge investment, right? Uh, Absolutely. And so not. you could try try some things to, to try in those stalls. Mm. Talking about investment, we'll be moving on to trying to answer the question, is it profitable? But just before we do that, I think I see Anne-Marie with the mic in hand. Oh, Elsa, Dr. Vassar has a question. It's just a follow-up question. Are you not worried if um, to get some aberration on the hooks uh, with the bedding guard? Yeah, so so very good question from uh, Dr. Elsa Vassour in terms of the potential for abrasion on the hawks of cows with with the bedding keeper. And this is where, um, and we're going to talk about next time as well, we're going to talk about stall size because, uh, and this is the challenge again, and, and, and I think I mentioned in our last webinar, uh, when it comes to cow comfort, often it's a whole package, right? So we can get the bedding right, uh, but if our stalls aren't sized appropriately for our cows, that can be a challenge. So in that case, if our stalls are appropriately sized and the cows fit well into the stalls, then their legs shouldn't be hanging off the back and shouldn't be rubbing on something like a bedding keeper. But if our stalls are too short, then we're going to run that risk. Mm -hmm. and, and we see that in a lot of scenarios. And, and, and I think we talked about it last time. If, if, say, our flooring is more comfortable than our stalls, well, then they're going to want to spend more time standing on floors or even yeah. lying down on floors, right? right. So, so we need to think about all these things together in yeah. terms of we, we can improve one thing, but we better make sure that everything else kind of follows along or... Otherwise, we're going to still run into problems with our cows. So profitability. We know that it's not easy to put numbers on comfort. And even though we're not talking about major investments here, um, we tried to make this simulation to try to see if 
we there's money that we can get out of this process by improving uh, the the comfort of the surface. Uh, so we've created this farm. Can yeah. you present us to yeah. the? So so this is um, again this is an attempt just to show you what the potential for profitability might be in terms of. Uh, improving comfort on farms by changing uh, a bedding surface. And again, these are these are numbers. So the, the numbers you have on the screen here are uh, basically Canwest DHI averages, right? So from from it's from, Canadian, oh, Canadian, so Canadian so, what? So, from so, coast to coast, coast to coast. Good. Um, and so coast. Oh yeah, I should have read that. Sorry. So <laughs> so let's say DHI and Valacta numbers, uh, coast to coast. So. Basically, uh, average farm with uh, almost 84 kilograms of, of quota, uh, production uh, just under 9,400 kilos per cow per year, um, uh, milk components just over 4% fat, 3.3% protein, age of first calving about 26 months, uh, cows greater than their third lactation are equal about 39%, and a calling rate uh, fairly similar at about 36%. So this is what we've considered in our calculations, yeah. but uh, what what's the number that we can use to relate well, that to comfort? Well, I guess there's there's a couple things. So, so as we spoke last time, we can think about some different metrics. Coming up with uh, hard numbers in terms of improvement and profitability associated with improved comfort uh, is, is very difficult because it's not just... Um, uh, you do one thing, it changes one thing, and cows magically produce more milk. Um, so we need to make a few assumptions there. Um, we talked about last time, we talked about this idea that, yeah, if cows are limited, particularly if they're very limited in terms of resting time, there's a potential there. There has been some estimates of uh, improvement in milk production with more rest time, particularly cows that um, are, are very limited and, and get up to a more appropriate kind of range in the 10 to 14 hour maybe a uh, 13 hour range of, of resting time per day. Okay. Um, other things like we talked about last time, uh, getting more lactations out of cows, right? Absolutely. So, so keeping older cows, making sure that we're actually gaining the profits and, 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 and reaping the benefits of, of the replacements that we're raising on farm. And so by having more longevity in our herds, we can, we can account for that as well. And okay. so, so in the case of this farm mm -hmm. here, just from an idea perspective, we, we, we propose going from some type of harder bedding surface um, and, and with, a, with a clegg value of six. So whatever that surface might have been, um, I'm not sure if we actually put it in there, what, they, what, what the farm might have been on before, but say, let's say a, a harder mattress with very little bedding and suddenly we've uh, put in new softer mattresses and also gone to... Um, uh, a more substantial amount of bedding on top exactly. of those mattresses, uh, which again are going to be not only good from a softness perspective, but also meeting those other criteria which we talked about, and um, and 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 looking at what potential impact that might have on that farm. And so these are some of the estimates based on maybe getting about say an hour, hour and a half more uh, lying time out of the cows per day, a uh, decrease in injuries, a decrease in lameness that we're going to see. Uh, potentially improved production. So our, mm -hmm. the, the model that was come up with is about uh, 800 kilos, just over 800 kilos more milk per cow per year, um, which uh, for a herd the size of it, with a quota system, we could look at it two ways. We could look at actually increasing overall production. In this case, we model it as can we actually produce the same amount of quota with actually less cows? Exactly. And so we could actually save, in this case, almost seven cows per year in terms of uh, feeding and, and, and maintaining. And, and, and we can actually boost up our um, uh, older cows within the herd by, by, a, by a modest percentage point uh, in this case. And so if we add that all up, we see uh, an improvement in profitability. In this case, thinking about uh, the, the improvement in production, feeding less cows uh, uh, over and above the cost of the, uh, the infrastructure itself, being at about a $15,000 uh, benefit to the producer in that case. That's per year, and that's net. Yes. Yeah, I mean, again, it's yeah. a simulation here, but yeah, I is, mean, it gives us over, an idea. This is yeah. over an eight-year period. If we're looking at the kind of the mm -hmm. the, the lifespan of those mattresses, of those as mattresses. Well. Yeah. So we we are presuming here that potentially this could be beneficial in terms of profitability. Yeah. 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 
And again, every situation is going to be unique. And, and exactly. so I don't want to say that this, uh, the last thing I'll say is this is how much money you're going to make if you do this. And, and that's not, this is just an example of how we could actually look at some of these things from, exactly. a, from a profitability standpoint. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So that's pretty much what we had to say in terms of uh, comfort of the surface today. If you have more questions, uh, you can still send them. But uh, while you're doing so, uh, of course, we're going to give it a homework. <laughs> and uh, you only have a week to do this homework because our next webinar is already next week. Yeah, less than a week. Less than a week. Next, You're absolutely Wednesday, right. right. So, so yeah, April get 6th. on to it. <laughs> Your teacher is talking yeah. here. <laughs> so basically what we're going to ask uh, our participants today is to pick one one, let's say, uh, a third lactation or above cow, a, a big cow, and measure measure the cow. So what do they have to, to measure? So we're going to look at two things. As you see on the screen, look at basically how high our cows are. So we're going to look at the hip height of the cow and we're going to look at the hip width of the cow. And, and we're going to um, uh, do this if you want to measure more than one and get some averages, that'd be great. But yep. uh, what we want to do is try to look for basically some of the larger cows within our herds exactly. and, and get an estimate of, of these two measures. And, and we're going to basically apply that to um, some of the concepts we talk about next week in terms of mm -hmm. uh, the size of the stall, mm -hmm. in terms of the, the width, in terms of the length, in terms of the position of things like uh, exactly. uh, the neck rail. And, and, and so the other part of this is actually to measure the stalls uh, exactly. that your cows are in as well. So looking at the width of uh, basically from one stall divider to another. So again, whether that be in a tie stall, whether it be in a free stall, looking at the distance between your, your stall dividers. Exactly. Um, as well as looking at from basically the brisket board to the end of the stall or from the basically the front curb in a tie stall back to the, the end curb yes. in, in a tie stall, measuring that distance there, basically the usable space uh, for that cow to lie down in, exactly. um, in, in that scenario. And for the hip width, uh, you want to go from one hip bone on top of the cow to the other, right? So well, we're looking at basically the, the, the width itself. So we can estimate kind of, you can hold it up and kind of, yeah, over top and just, just take it and go like this over, over the back. Okay. Hip, hip with the cow. Yeah. So anyway, all the indications of what to measure and what you need to note. And I think it will be very interesting for you to have these numbers in hand for the next webinar because then you'll be able to uh, see where you're standing uh, by the recommendations. Uh, it's all available on the dairyknowledge.ca website where you have registered or will register for this webinar. webinar. Um, you will also be able uh, to uh, watch again the recordings or, or have access. Actually, I haven't mentioned that for the Beaufrand Farm or Irma Farm, which are the two uh, practical examples that we've uh, went through today, uh, there are videos available. So if you want to really see what it looks like in the barn and hear the producers themselves describe uh, the process, the process what they've done basically. Uh, there are videos that we will make available. They are also available on YouTube on the Valacta channel. Um, thank you very much, Trevor, oh, for uh, running again. with yeah, us no. today, moving with I'm us. I'm glad everything worked out. <laughs> yes, and, yep. yes. <laughs> there, thank you very much to uh, the McDonald campus uh, team who uh, helped us uh, happen, set up. Yeah. yeah, and everybody at Valacta's team who helped us uh, that uh, very quickly. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see everybody next week from some mystery location, maybe. Right? Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> who, knows, yes. who knows where we'll end up being, Maybe right? we're so. all flying to Guelph <laughs> next time. <laughs> all right. That'd be thanks. easier. No. <laughs> well, it depends for yeah. whom. But. <laughs> all right. Anyway. Thank you very much. And next time, as uh, Trevor mentioned a couple of times today, we will be discussing a comfortable space for the cow. So, and this will be the last and third uh, webinar of this series on uh, uh, the barn, a source of comfort. Thank you very much for being with us today. And again, if you have any comments or questions, please send them along or tweet them and we will, uh, we will look at them. Thank you very much. Thank you.